Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. This is the art of the self-authored film with, and I've been saying this in all the emails and all the WhatsApp messages we've been sending out, one of my very favourite film producers, uh, Hannah Long Higgins from the Washington Thank you. Bureau. I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you all for joining. Um, I, I hope that you get some practical, maybe inspiration or tips from this, but I'm very much a collaborator at heart, and um, I hope this starts a conversation between all of us about how we can make videos uh, that are really high quality, and I hope to learn from you as well. So I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Dan. Oh, you're really welcome. I was I'm honestly really, really, really excited to have you. Thank you so much for uh, coming on the course today. Um, let's start with the most simple and obvious question. Uh, could you introduce yourself and describe what you do? My name is Hannah Long Higgins and I'm a video journalist based in the Washington Bureau. And so we cover stories across the US and we also work in collaboration with several really talented folks in the Toronto office. Um, and so on a day-to-day -day basis, I am pitching, producing, filming, and editing mostly self-authored videos for both a U.S. audience and a global audience. Why, why do you love being a video journalist? Why do you love doing what you do? I love doing what I do because video journalism combines so many of my passions and interests. My background pre-journalism is actually in photography. And so I gravitated towards video storytelling when I went to journalism school because I loved being able to capture in moving images um, the stories and people that I was uh, meeting and coming across. But I especially love video because it invites people into a new experience of a story they may have heard before. And I love getting to work with music, sound, images, people. Um, I love the complexity of it and how it all kind of fits together into one puzzle. And I think if you get really lucky and the conditions are right and you're prepared, the result can be something that's powerful or amusing. It can make people laugh. And I love that, uh, it's on the internet forever so people can return to it and hopefully see new things each time they watch. Right, we're talking about self-authored films today. Um, a kind of a staple, a classic of the digital video world. Just describe what is a, a self-authored film and why do they work so well for digital? A self-authored film is a film that has no outside narrator. That's the best way that I can describe it. So the people or the person at the center of the story um, are the voices that you hear that are guiding you through the story. They are highly engaging, they're emotional, they're intimate, because there's no barrier between you, the viewer, and the, the person whose story you are absorbing. I think that self-authored films allow for more creative freedom. Um, and actually, Dan and I were talking about this earlier. The self-authored model is actually really prevalent today on social platforms. I think people are drawn to the first person perspective. You've gone to social media, any social media platform, people are telling you what they're doing as they're doing it from their perspective. You're hearing from people firsthand. And I think that that sticks because it's, it's powerful. It's powerful to hear people speaking for themselves. I think when self-authored film is done really well, it looks effortless, but most of you here who've dabbled in it probably know it's extremely labor intensive and actually takes a lot more work on the front end of things to make it work. No, it really does. Um, we're gonna watch a lot of your films throughout this afternoon or bits of, of lots of your films. What are your tips? If you're, if you're sitting down with a VJ for the first time and you're giving them your tip, where, where would you start? I would start with the people you're interested in filming because, and, and I want to introduce a concept that my colleagues and I have been discussing in DC, which is I'm trying to lean away from calling 
the people in self-authored films characters uh, because we found recently and we've done some reflecting that that can actually be quite dehumanizing um, if you're in a shoot and you're accidentally referred to the person you're working with as your character like it just it it, it can be kind of detrimental to the relationship and kind of strips them of their dignity a little bit so we're trying to reframe and shout out to Shrey Popat if he's on this uh, he came up with let's call these people contributors because that's exactly what they are. So if you come across a story and you're interested in using that person as the main contributor in your self-authored film, they need to be someone who is good at talking. And if that person is not an engaging personality and they're not good at telling their own story, it's probably not going to be a great fit for a self-authored film and, th and that's just the reality not every person you meet is meant to be the star of a self-authored film so you kind of have to judge very early on is this going to work and is this going to be worth completing the process and you can tell in one phone call uh doesn't have to be a zoom you can tell in one phone conversation if that person is going to be a strong contributor so that's my top tip is the people are at the heart of self-authored films. And if you don't have the right people, it's going to be really challenging to make it work. What are you looking for in your contributor? I'm looking for someone who can clearly tell me their story in a way that makes sense. Can they speak chronologically? Um, what's the energy like on the phone? Are they excited? Are, are they emotional? Are they in a place where they're ready to share their story? Um, if I'm not, if I'm excited talking to them and we're having a conversation that is just kind of growing from what it, from, from the beginning, that means that this is someone who has the energy and the personality to draw you in. Um, but if the person is reluctant to talk, if they're maybe not ready to talk, if, uh, they don't understand kind of what it is that I'm trying to do. Um, and that's my job to explain how the process will work. You know, I'm going to be coming with a video camera. This is how the day will look. Uh, it's not going to be a good fit. And you can tell it's a gut instinct. Is this person going to be able to clearly communicate their story? Um, but I also, there is a, a spectrum because I also don't want people who told their story a million times and are really rehearsed. Uh, because that can also lose some authenticity when you're actually sitting down to do the interview if they're extremely media trained. You just want real people who are open to talking and are good communicators. How much of this comes down to the video journalist's personal skills, though? I mean, how much can you coax somebody into to opening up to you? I think you can do a, a huge amount when it comes to coaxing someone to opening up and 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 it's your job to draw them out. Um, but again, not everyone is in that place. So if someone responds to you enthusiastically and is excited about the possibility of doing this, and uh, sometimes, it, sometimes it requires a great deal of work on your end. It just depends on the person. Sometimes I really have to work to get people to open up and maybe the story is still worth doing, but I know the interview is gonna be challenging and it's my job to make that person comfortable enough to get to the place where we can then get to telling the story um, so it is it is a give and take give us then some of your little tricks that you use to get people to feel more comfortable etc i always assure people that this is just a conversation um, we all know it's not just a conversation because we're actually working like 10 times what we would do in a normal conversation. But on the phone, when I first meet people, I just express a genuine interest in their story. I tell them kind of the flow of the day and how it's going to go. When I show up at their house or wherever they may be, I have to immediately try to put them at ease. There is nothing natural about having someone walk into your life with video equipment um, and ask you to tell your life story. I don't know very many people who are just immediately comfortable with that. So 
what I do, even if I'm on a really limited time budget, I show up, I have a conversation, I don't immediately get the camera out. I kind of just make small talk. I try to do a recce and see what the space is like and where we could film. And I assure them while I'm doing that work, especially if I'm on my own and I have to kind of do the small talk while I'm also setting up, I assure them this is gonna be really easy. It's just a conversation. You're just talking to me. There's nothing you need to do to prepare for this. It's gonna be really, really natural. And again, they're a little bit skeptical, but then when, when I sit down in the chair and I have, it depends on the video and it depends on if I'm working with a team or not. But if it's just me, I have people typically look slightly off camera. So they're having a conversation with me directly. And the spiel that I give is I explain once again, there will be no outside narrator in this piece. I will not be in it. And so your voice is the only voice that we're going to hear. And what that means on a practical level for you is that you need to reframe my questions in your answer. And then I always give the example of if I ask what color is the sky and someone says blue, I cannot use that answer and I have to ask again. If I say what color is the sky, I need that person to say the color of the sky is blue. And that's a super basic example, but you would be amazed at how hard it is for some people to get that. And so we start to do the interview, we start to have the conversation. I want it to feel natural. I encourage them to say you're doing great. But if they are not saying answers in a way that I'm hearing for my future self to use in the edit, I have to stop them and I have to hopefully kindly ask them to redo it. You have to maintain a sense of control over the interview without it seeming like that. So that is a really delicate dance, but that is the fundamental key thing uh, that makes or breaks the self-authored film. I was chatting to a colleague a year or two ago, Mo Medi, I don't know if he's on the call today. He's a fabulous VJ. And we were talking about this very, very same problem. And he gave me a, a word of advice that I've never forgotten. He said, I'm not ticking off the questions that I ask, I'm ticking off the answers that I get, meaning that he's thinking before he's like going on the interviews, thinking about what answers he's trying to get from the interview, from the interviewees. And it made absolute perfect sense. It's, it's that thing of listening out to make sure that the things that people have said are what you're kind of hoping they would say and whether those would work as individual clips. How much of it comes down to the framing of the questions that you ask, Hannah? I'm so glad you asked that because I was just about to add on to that brilliant advice mm. that often with self-authored, I will on my interview sheet, and I actually like to go in with a printed out copy of my questions or, or the answers that I need to get. And I make sure to keep that to myself so I don't leave that laying around but I really don't like to be on my phone during interviews. Um, that's just a personal preference. I like to have a hard piece of paper and it also signals to the person I'm interviewing, oh, she's prepared, she's taking this seriously, she's deeply engaged. And I like to be making full eye contact the entire time so that I'm not, I'm not writing things down. I'm, I'm trying to be really, really present with the person so that they feel they have my full attention. There's nothing worse than being interviewed and not feeling like they're paying attention, you know, to what you're saying. But oftentimes, instead of writing down the questions I'm going to ask, just like, is it Mo? I, I don't remember who you said. Mo, yeah, Mo, yeah. Yes. Mo, Mo Mitty. If you're listening, that's absolutely brilliant and resonates with what I like to do. I will even just write down, you know, childhood or um like very beginning or intro instead of writing out the full question because then that jogs my memory okay I need to cover their childhood specifically and then when I frame the question sometimes to get them to expand on their answer instead of asking them for example um what was it like when you walked in the room I will reframe it as a statement and say paint me a picture of the room when you walked in and then that invites them to 
I, and I often tell people, I want you to go back to where you were when this happened. What were you wearing? Where were you standing? Walk me through step by step what happened next. And we'll do it in little sections like that. But if you say, paint me a picture of what happened, paint me a picture of where you were, take me back to that feeling that you had, that's not a question, that's a statement I'm actually posing. But hopefully it's a good jumping off point and it actually invites people to be a lot more descriptive in their language. Really interesting. I on the courses that I, I teach, I say to everyone, always use the word describe or explain in every single question that you give. And also never ever feel embarrassed to ask the really obvious question. You know, it's the really obvious questions, the ones that we as journalists feel sometimes too embarrassed to ask. Those are the ones that you will definitely, those are the questions you'll definitely end up using the answers to, I, I think. We yeah, have nothing, taken a question. Sorry, go on, Hannah, you go first. I was going to say, nothing is too mundane or basic. So true. Um, we've had a few questions sent in. Uh, two of them I'm going to hang on for a little bit later to, to ask. Uh, Ali asks, if you have to choose between the perfect shot and the perfect question, which one would you pick? Ooh. Um, this describe is, why. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is really tough because it really depends on the situation. I would say though, if I had to apply a blanket answer to all situations, um, when you are really pressed for time um, and you your time with people is limited and you're working on their schedule, make sure you ask all of the questions that you wanna ask and you soak up the interview time. Um, I'd much rather, if I have three hours, I'd much rather spend two and a half hours asking the questions and getting the story building blocks and then cramming what I can. And I'm, I love to film, so this is hard for me to say, but then I would rather get wallpaper shots, B-roll, and maybe ask for photographs that they have. But I can't go back in time and have them state this key sentence that I need for the story to make sense. But I can go back in time and maybe get pictures to cover something or I could even use, and I'll talk about this later, but I could use moments from the interview while they're listening to me ask the question, they're not talking and it actually is a video portrait. So 99% of the time you have built-in video portraits that you can use. Um, I, I think I'd choose question over shot if I'm on a really tight time budget. I think I would too. Um, one more question, um, Alessand just asked, and I feel a bit, feel a bit bad asking you this because I only introduced you to the GIST formula literally an hour ago. Um, do we always need to follow the GIST formula for self-authored? For those who don't know what the GIST formula is, it's, uh, it's a formula for video uh, in which you grab the audience's attention with a, a strong clip or a clip that creates curiosity. You introduce the character, you tell their story, which is the what, the where, the when, the why, the how, and you finish with a, a closing thought or a takeaway. Is that something you, you resonate with, Hannah? I think it is super important to master that formula before you then break the rules. Um, if you can do the GIST formula, which is very similar to how I learned, how I started, and often still what I do if I'm doing something that's much shorter, if you can do that, you really do have the, the skills and building blocks to then expand and do longer pieces and to mix it up. And today I am going to talk about mixing it up, but I want to emphasize that to do some of the, these other setups, it's important to have that understanding of the GIST formula. It really is simple, but it's genius and it works nearly every time. Thank you so much. You know, I think it is Hannah, I think it's time to watch some of your films. Why don't you introduce this to us? If you haven't seen this film, everyone, do watch the whole thing. It is literally one of my favourite videos the BBC has ever produced. Sorry to make you blush, Hannah, but I love it. <laughs> you you it introduce me, it for us. Yeah, it makes me laugh because this was never supposed to happen. Um, this was a story I read about several years ago now, I think in the Washington Post, I don't remember where exactly I first saw it, 
it's a story of uh, basically two next door neighbors, two women living next door to each other. One of them had been looking for her long lost sister for years. Um, she'd look all over and come to find out that person she'd been searching for was her next door neighbor. And I absolutely love that story. It made me smile. It was uh, in the middle of, shall we say, a tough few years uh, in the U.S. <laughs> uh, in terms of stories. And so I, I really liked that it was light, but it also spoke to this human experience, you know, and I don't know how it is around the world, but in a lot of communities in the U.S., it's common to not know your neighbors. Um, and so I thought that this tapped into kind of a larger, more profound theme. So essentially, I pitched this story in a morning news meeting, and it's not really news or breaking news. Um, this story had broken in a local paper and then been covered by a few different kind of talk shows or broadcasters in the years since, but it had just come onto my radar at that moment. I pitched it and my colleagues really liked it, but it just wasn't top priority. We had so much other stuff we needed to cover. Um, my editor said, keep it on the back burner, you know, keep it in mind, but we can't really justify sending you to Wisconsin um, to just cover this really heartwarming story. So I did keep it on the back burner and I did find myself in Wisconsin and Iowa on a separate trip for completely unrelated stories that were on the campaign trail. And I said to um, my editor, I really, really think I should go meet these women while I'm here and just try to film this. And we actually almost didn't have time. Uh, we were, it was a super busy trip. We were doing like three other stories. And um, I was actually traveling with my editor. He said, if you really want to do it, um, you have my blessing, go do it tomorrow morning and I'll meet you afterwards and I'll crack on with other stuff. So I woke up that morning and almost, I, I really wanted to back out because I was so tired. <laughs> um, but I thought, no, this, this will be fun to edit um, and this will be uplifting. So I went, I did three interviews and you'll notice hopefully what those three different interviews are. I did two interviews one-on-one -on -one with each uh, contributor, and I did one interview with both contributors sitting together um, next to each other. And you'll see why I did that, and we can talk about that after you watch this clip. But essentially, I filmed this in three hours, and then I edited, I had about a week to knock out the edit. Um, and this was the unexpected result. I never wanted to ruin anyone's life, you know, or like be a surprise where they didn't want anything to do with me. And now there's this woman moved next door to me. I can make her really sad or I ruined some family secret. So I pull up my father's obituary and see that it says Don Johnson. The phone lights up and it says, um, hi, this is, you know, Hillary, your next door neighbor. Is your last name Johnson? Were you Miss Loyal Cornfest Queen? I said, yes, I was Miss Loyal Cornfest in 1983. And she goes, well, who's, who's your, your dad? I said Wayne Klaus, but unfortunately, unfortunately he passed away in 2010. 2010. And it was like silent for a couple minutes. Oh my gosh, it's her. It's Don Johnson. And I said, it, you and me have the same dad, don't we? And she's like, yeah, I'm your sister. I'm like, oh my gosh. You know, I was just, just in shock. Holy crap, now what? Now what's our dynamic going to be like? And the next day I ended up bringing pictures of her biological father because she has never met him and uh, brought her flowers and a card and said, you know, welcome sis, I'm glad to meet you. We talked a lot. We spent a lot of time together. We're very fortunate we that have, we uh, we've had a very have, good experience. have a really yes. good connection together. I feel like Dawn's over here a lot. I mean, not like not like that, but I, I'll, I'll ask her for things. Like, honestly, I've probably asked her for at least 10 rolls of toilet paper. A lot of life changes. Um, a lot of firsts for both of us. Hillary, I'm expecting become. another little girl in a couple months. I've kind of felt like Dawn was there now as a neighbor and a sister and a grandma. Yeah, we see each other we every day. We see each other every she day. She comes home from work and I'll go out there and talk to her. 
people really don't know each other any, anymore. They just are too busy with each other's lives and they never really do get to know your neighbors. So be kind to your neighbor because you never know, it could be your sister you've been looking for. I think the trick here, there are a few things. Um, I would not be acknowledging fully what made this work if I didn't thank the split screen for helping me <laughs> make this possible. Um, the split screen effect allowed me to get away with avoiding jump cuts and reusing certain shots, but you see them differently if they're only on half the screen, but then you jump to full screen. And it also kind of plays a trick with your eye where you're you're kind of noticing each person a little bit more. And then I could I could play the same, they, they often say the same sentence in the same way in each of their separate interviews. And then I could stitch those together. And all of that's intentional. That's how I interviewed them. I wrote down before I went into this, several sentences that I knew I needed them to say, not in the exact same way because I'm not putting words in their mouth, but Sometimes it is about having two or three words to start the sentence with. So, for example, I, I did Hillary's interview first, I think, and I was remembering and mentally clocking how she said a few of her sentences. Then when I interviewed Dawn, the older sister, I said, I want to know, you know, the moment you found out that you were sisters, and can you start the sentence with, because Hillary had said she picked up the phone and called. Start the sentence with, I answered the phone. You know, and sometimes it is okay to prompt them with the beginning so that you know you have these mirroring sentences. So that was something that I did really intentionally. Um, but I, I do think the trick to this is even when you're under a lot of pressure in terms of time, I mean, this is an overwhelming job. I'm, maybe it's not for all of you, but for me, it, it, it does get easier, but it also doesn't. You are handling a lot. You're handling the filming, you're handling the producing, you're thinking about your future self, or maybe your colleague in the future who's gonna have to edit this thing. You're making people feel comfortable. You're doing a recce of the space. You're setting up, you're figuring out if your mics work. Like it can actually, be a crushing amount of pressure. Um, but what you have to do is avoid feeling panicked and rushed because that type of uh, approach will not yield this kind of, you know, calm, uh, humorous uh, answers and energy from your contributors. So I think it's really important to actually on your shot list or in your mental plan, however you're doing it, build in moments of silence, build in empty spaces, and make sure that the key is, even if you're under a lot of pressure and you don't have a lot of time to do the interview, go slow. And as soon as they finish answering a question, pause and sit with it. And that's another thing I tell people up front. I'm going to be nodding vigorously to, and I would love in a normal conversation to jump in and affirm what you're saying, but I can't do that. And I'm also going to wait about five seconds before I respond and ask the next question. And it's going to feel awkward, but what I'm doing is building in some spaces because oftentimes it's, it's not even what people are saying, it's what they're not saying at the beginning and end of their sentence. If someone says, you know, at the end there, Hillary says, Don is over here a lot. And then Don kind of goes, you know, hey, and shoots her a look. And it's really funny. But if I had jumped in immediately with, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by she's over there a lot? I, then I would have lost that natural moment. So it really is about kind of grounding yourself in a calmer <laughs> uh, state of mind to be like, there is enough time to get this but I need those empty spaces in between questions. I need video portraits. I need just shots of Hillary and Dawn staring out the window without saying anything because those are really gonna help me in the edit and make it sing. 
I learned almost by mistake once the power of silence as well. There's a weird dynamic with silence. If you ask somebody a question and they answer it, the immediate pressure is on you, the interviewer, to fill the next bit of silence, to come up with another question. But if you pause and pause, suddenly the pressure goes back on the person you're interviewing to, to carry on talking. And that's where I find you get the really, really interesting answers out of people. It's a very, very uncomfortable moment where you just, you are going quiet on them, but it makes them talk a bit more and makes them open up. And it's such a useful trick that I learned. And I, I, I cannot tell you how many great answers I've got from people using that trick, that pausing trick, because suddenly the pressure goes on them to kind of open up a bit more. It's really, really interesting. Absolutely. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, build in that time and that space. Even if you only have an hour to film with someone, take your time. And people pick up on your mood and your energy. And if you walk into a space with people who are already probably a little bit nervous about being filmed and you're manic and rushed, it doesn't really invite them to open up and be you know, able to give you the best possible answers. So they're really looking to you to set the tone. And I would also say this was a case where my pre-interview, you know, that in, the, in this story, I think I talked to Don just once before I went. I hadn't talked to Hillary before, but Don sounded great on the phone. She was really willing to do it. She said Hillary was as well. And this was all so last minute. I you know, I didn't have a lot of time to do a ton of pre-planning. But what I do when I do those initial phone calls is I'm sitting at my computer and I'm taking notes and I'm writing down quotes that they're saying. Because when you're in the room with them, then you can draw upon those quotes and have them say them again. And this is a really beautiful thing. So the last line of, the reason I chose the end of this too is I love the last line she says, you know, people really don't know their neighbors anymore. Um, you, and you should be kind to your neighbors because you never know it could be your sister. She didn't say that in the interview, but I remember that she had said that in our first phone call. And I knew it would make a really strong ending. So I said, Don, you mentioned something really powerful on the phone. Can you just say that to me again? You said, you know, why it's so important for us to know our neighbors. Why is that? And she said, oh, right. And then she said the line. But if I hadn't written that down from our phone call, I would have missed it. And the ending wouldn't have been as strong. So that's just those initial phone calls are really, really key and can really help your future self. So do you have a sort of script in mind? I hate using the word script because it makes it sound like, you know, you're saying to people, you must say this, which, of course, you're not doing. But do you have a, a, a script in mind? Do you, do you have a clear idea what your film is going to look like? I knew that I wanted to build up to the end where they are finding out and they're meeting. Now, digital video is challenging because you almost have to promise your audience what they're going to get to convince them to watch past four seconds in the first place. So with the title of this and in the, the map page description, you already know what's going to happen. And, and that kind of killed me a little bit because I wanted it to be a big reveal. Uh, but I, I also knew that the whole point of the story is like the questions I immediately had when I first read about it were, how do they find out? Like, how do they piece that together? And how long did they go before they knew? And then what was that like? The story in and of itself is so insane and statistically unlikely <laughs> that I think even with knowing what's going to happen, people are still hopefully have those burning questions and want to start watching. We, at least on our team, often cut these intro teasers that do give you a taste of what's going to come. And our hope with that is that, again, we are uh, convincing people, if you stick around and watch this whole video, here's what you're going to get. You're going to get to see this moment and this moment and this moment. We don't do that for every video, but that is a formula we use a lot. So overall, when I did the interview, I knew I needed to ask questions 
uh, that ticked things off chronologically. And so I did go in with a list, you know, my introduction questions. I knew I wanted to know about each of them separately and what they were doing, but I also didn't have a lot of time to go too far into their backstory. So I quickly pivoted to the, the days and hours leading up to the moment they found out. Um, and I just kind of ticked off that list. And again, it's not about putting words into people's mouths, but it is about being able to be fully present and absorbing their answer while also thinking about the edit. And if, if they're not saying things in a way that makes sense on their own as a sentence, it, it's not usable. And then I have to guide them through a little bit before they say it. So that the they say it again. The thing about asking the two sisters the same sets of questions, to explain how that works when it comes to doing the edit. Yeah, so I would say, um, for starters, I don't like other people, other contributors in the story to be in the room when I'm doing an interview with another contributor. So I really didn't want Don to hear what Hillary was saying, what I was asking while I was doing it, because I didn't want her to then start to pre-plan what she was going to say. So in general, I explain to people, you know, for sound purposes and to make everyone as comfortable as possible, can you go over to your house for 20 minutes, Don, and then um, we'll have, we'll kind of switch you out when it's your turn. So it's just Hillary in the room and then it's just Don in the room. People have wandering eyes. It's already hard to get them to look right at you or right exactly where you want them to look. And having other people in the room is distracting. So if you can immediately eliminate that dis distraction without being rude, that's really helpful. And then it was a matter of, who, I knew that whoever went first would be the guide for the other interview. And so I just listened for key phrases and moments and then made sure that the other person said, this, described the same exact moment. Then in the edit, uh, after I transcribed the interviews and started to script things out, this was a case where I call this type of story um, an ice sculpture story because all, it's just like a block of material that's all really good. And you have to keep chiseling away and, and trimming the fat until you're left with this beautiful, you know, piece that, that works on its own. Um, other stories, you don't necessarily start with that much solid material. So my first edit of this was like 14 minutes or something like that. And I had just laid out the bites chronologically and I looked for the key moments and then I had both of them saying it. And then as I continued to chop down farther, I realized like, oh, I can really cut in on that bite even more. Actually, I only need Don saying one word here. Um, so it went from being this really drawn out, honestly, pretty boring thing to watch to working with the music and working with the pace to just get the essential essence of what they were saying. And I could really play that off of each other. And this works well in this story because it's about these two people meeting. But this is a concept you can apply to really any story where more than one person has had a shared experience. Um, and I hope that's something you can take with you that if you read a story where something happened and there were two different people who were there, um, do two separate interviews with them, ask them questions in a similar way, then do an interview with them together if they have some sort of relationship. And it just creates kind of a chemistry that you're not going to have if you're just asking one person about it. Absolutely agree. Um, Larissa has sent in a question. Uh, when setting up some of these shots around the interview, i.e. the Amazon parcel being handed over, how did you come up with what would feel natural? Do you have questions in mind that you asked that led to you knowing what would work when it came to filming sequences like that? Excellent question. So in this case, I did the interviews first. Because to uh, the earlier question, I knew I need to prioritize asking all the questions I want to ask, and then I will figure out visuals uh, afterwards. And I also knew, because I hadn't talked with them too extensively beforehand, if you ever get the chance to do the interview first, I recommend it, 
because that gives you ideas for things that you can film around their house. They may say something that you weren't aware of that, you know, let's say someone brings up the fact that they're really into organizing things and they like to have a clean house and you didn't know that about their personality, but because you've done the interview first, now you can walk around their house and find examples of that and be sure to capture that before you go. So in this case, um, honestly, I was desperate for B-roll. I had no idea how I was going to paint this thing. And after the interviews were done, I just thought, okay, I'll do some video portraits. I asked, uh, actually, they naturally had a package. Don, or I think Don's handing it to Hillary. Um, they already had a package and they were already doing that. But what I did say is, can you please do that again? Because I missed the shot. Like while I was filming an exterior of the house, uh, they had this package delivered and Don went and took it over. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. Like, I need that. <laughs> can you, can you do that again? And I felt like that was ethical because they had just done it. So I'm just basically asking them to reenact that. Um, so I don't always know, but I, if I do the interview first, it gives me more ideas of things to look for. And honestly, like I said before, this video would not have worked without the split screen. Um, if you're ever really thin on visuals, this is a way to kind of make that problem your solution. Absolutely. I've got a question I'm really pleased Ali has asked. Your selection of music, do you choose your own music? How much time do you spend? And do you always have an idea of what kind of music you want from the start? I use our audio network subscription. Um, I don't know if all of you have access to that, but that's what our team uses. And I, I know, Dan, you like to pick music before you go on shoot sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. I'm not able to do that. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I definitely, I'll start actually really considering music when I'm back from the shoot and when I'm starting to go through footage. Um, for me, music is such a huge part of the process, and it's honestly really fun for me. Some people don't enjoy it. I absolutely love mixing the music in, and I am editing from a pretty early stage with music. I know some people are a little more maybe purist about it and do the full edit and then add music at the end. I see music as like another voice in your piece. And actually, I often will cut to music. So it's really when I'm back, I'm reviewing my footage, I'm figuring out like, what's the tone of this really gonna be? And one trick that I've learned over the years is listen to the entire song because I often will use different parts of different songs. I think a lot of times like when we're rushed and overwhelmed, the tendency is to just slap a song underneath at the end, and just use the whole thing. Or whenever the video ends, you cut the music off. But actually, if you use your music to help paint a picture of what's going on and really help guide your edit, you can take, you know, the middle part of one song. I actually often also use multiple songs per video because it's helpful to kind of shift the mood slightly or shift the pace. At the end of all of my videos now, I didn't always do this. If a scene is ending or a video is ending, you're hearing the end of a song. Like it, you can cut the end of a song and put it at the end of your video and blend it in um, because I realized, wait, I can use this music however I need to. Um, so I would invite you to listen to the entire song because there may be part of it that really works. And some of my colleagues are brilliant at this, building in time also without music where there's not sound is really important. Similar to getting visuals where people aren't talking, it is important to let the piece breathe. And this is one of my growing edges is to use less music sometimes because I have a tendency to overdo it. Um, and so making sure the music is really complementing uh, what you're doing and not overtaking it. In one of my courses, I use this film as an example of how to use music. It's such a brilliant use of music. Uh, when this sister talks, she talks much more quickly. So the pace of the music 
is much much faster i can tell you've done a few kind of jump cuts as well to keep her pace up so it's in time with the music and when the other sister talks she's much more considered she's more thoughtful the music slows down it, it's an absolute masterpiece um hannah let's watch another one of your films this one tell us about this one this is uh mum meets dad i've called it uh, introduce this film for us yeah so i went from doing shorter self-authored films for several years kind of just you know living my life and then one day out of nowhere I was asked to do a documentary about a uh, young woman in the U.S. who discovers that she has about 21 uh, siblings from her donor father that she didn't know she had. This is probably a story you've heard about just in general um, or you've read news articles about this with DNA tests, people are finding out that they have dozens, sometimes hundreds, even thousands of siblings. They're called siblings, which is a donor sibling. And so I had the extreme privilege of making this with a super talented producer from the World Service, Ben Davis. This was his idea. He pitched it as a documentary. And basically, uh, I was asked to be the one to go film it. And I'll tell you the lessons I learned after we watch uh, this clip. So I, I want to speak to some of my mistakes because this was a huge learning experience for me. But the thing I want you to take away, because I recognize that within, like we are a news organization and it's rare that people are getting to do really long form projects. And so you may be thinking, well, this doesn't apply to my life because I'm not making half hour TV documentaries. That's great. She could do that, but I don't do that. I want you to walk away with some tips, though, for uh, how you can apply this stuff to shorter videos. And then if you are one day asked to do something longer form and you have the basics down, you know how to do gist, it, it's all the same, really. It's just a lot more filming. So you can, these are all important building blocks that will kind of open more opportunities for you down the road. So in this scene, um, Julia, our main contributor, this entire documentary is self-authored. Um, she is on the road meeting up with some of her siblings. She's meeting up with uh, her sister, Caroline, who she has met before, but she's going back to her for a visit. And this is an example of uh, when maybe you have more than one main contributor and how you can use them to help become the narrator. So I'll stop talking and let's, let's just have a watch. We're gonna go visit Carolyn, my half-sister. Carolyn was the first sibling that I made contact with. So I guess she's just the introduction, my introduction to the donor sibling world. Your haircut, when did that happen? That happened like a month ago. I, I just love it. it. Thank you. That's adorable. <laughs> When I was like growing up, I thought that maybe I have donor siblings, but then your mom was the first person to contact me. So that was like the first time I was like, oh, I have a donor sibling and it's you. <laughs> so I thought it was just 19 of us. And then Sam popped up and we were like, oh, Sam is another one that we didn't know about. There's definitely 20 of us. And my mom Sam has like an Excel spreadsheet. She does? <laughs> yeah, she it's has like with, I think, everybody that we have to date and like their parents and contact info. This is the sperm pipette, is that the word, um, that my mother used. <laughs> And here you can see that it says 1317. I guess she got this on June 6th of 95. So she used a little vial and um, syringe to self-inseminate. Um, and it came in the mail, it was frozen. She said that she warmed it up like so. I found out that my mom has, was actually in contact my entire childhood 
Um, and even before I was born with other moms, now that I'm 18, the rest of us are also adults. Um, we have established our own relationships with each other. She had these probably in her freezer for four to five months before she decided today's the day that I'm going to get pregnant. Um, just a message that's been sent in. Uh, Mum meets dad is my absolute favourite. That's from Neha Sharma, who is also an amazing video journalist. I was going to say thank you so much because you are one of my heroes. So thank you. That means a lot. What, what a loving. This is a loving. This is a loving. Intercontinental loving. Um, I love that film. I There's lots and lots I really like about that film, but I love the sense of kind of journey and adventure that, uh, that she's going on. And I think that's a great way to get viewers to stick with you when there's movement and there's constant explaining. I'm going off to meet one of my, my uh, what do you call diblings? Is that how you described? I just I love that sense of movement, the journey. She's driving, she's taking you, she's telling you where she's going and why. And it's such a great way to keep the, the viewer involved in the story. Yeah, I think this really stretched me beyond what I was doing, which is you film an interview, you film B-roll, you stitch it together with the gist model, and voila, you have a beautiful 90 second to three minute self-authored piece. But with this, the challenge was um, much more in a documentary style of there were unfolding scenes that we needed to capture and we needed to weave the interviews in and out of those. And I think even if you're not making documentaries, if you have any sort of contributor who is on a journey of discovery of some sort, you can still do your regular interview and then you can follow them for a couple of hours as they go to find something out or they go to meet up with someone else. And that's just a way to kind of elevate what you're already doing. And the the main message I want you to take away from this is what we can learn from our friends in radio. Because working with Ben Davis, he's absolutely brilliant. If you ever get a chance to work with him, do it. But he really helped me to understand that, you know, this was also, this also became a radio documentary. Dan, I can pass along the link to that if people want to experience it in a different medium. So when we were gathering, we were gathering for this and for a radio doc, which meant that Julia, uh, our main contributor, is having to explain what she's doing as she's doing it and what she's about to do. And it actually works really well for video too, because she is our narrator. She's bringing you along on her experience. And the things that Ben was asking her to describe are not necessarily things that I, as a video person, would have asked because I would just assume people would get that information from seeing it. But in this situation, it actually really helped. And you always want to be asking, you know, you, you also need shots of your contributor just driving and not talking or just walking and not talking. But they can set up what you're about to see in a way that traditionally, uh, if you're working with a correspondent, that's what they're about to do. But you don't have that person now. So you really have to coach your Julia through that process. And I think it worked well in the end because she, you are with her, you are on this journey, you're following her and you are discovering things as she is discovering things, which is actually quite powerful. Um, and I think using, uh, what, the point I wanted to make too is in the previous video we watched, I did two separate interviews and then I'm cutting their answers to kind of create this one voice. In this situation, we have two people who are sharing an experience, but they're talking to each other. And we ask them to do that. We ask them to sit down and talk with each other. We had bread at the table, as you can see, um, but we were throwing out questions. And then we asked them to answer in conversation with each other. So it's a little bit of a hybrid where it's not completely uh, in situ verite filming where we are just observing and letting it happen. We are kind of guiding the process by saying, talk about the spreadsheet that your mom has or talk about who you've met uh, on your journey so far. 
and then we would step back and have them talk about it. And that's just a nice trick. Again, even if you're doing a shorter digital video and you have two people, mom and daughter, whoever it may be in the kitchen, cooking, eating dinner, have them sit down and throw out some questions that they can answer to each other or invite them to kind of interview each other about the topic. And it's just like a refreshing way to get that information. Neha asks, when the four siblings meet eventually in the film, they looked utterly happy and bonded beautifully. Was it all organic or did you have to rub off some of your happy energy? <laughs> that was organic. That was an absolutely incredible scene to get to watch firsthand because they genuinely connected and clicked and they were all just such wonderful people. <laughs> it was actually really, really sweet to watch. I will say though, that took a lot of setup. So Julia, Ben and I arrived at the park where, where everyone met really early. We found the picnic table where we were gonna, we knew we wanted them to organically meet, but we had to decide where is that gonna happen. So we scouted, okay, we're going to have Julia walking from the parking lot this way. Meanwhile, um, her other siblings were in three other locations in the park. And Ben and I went and met with them, introduced ourselves, told them what was going to happen. And we didn't want any of them to meet before we caught it on film. So we had to make sure they weren't seeing each other. Like Julia was in the car. The other three were in three other spots. And then when the time came and I was ready to film it, um, we kind of said, okay, now. And we actually had the three siblings waiting at the picnic table and then we had Julia. It was, we just, I was the only camera person so it wasn't possible to film everyone kind of converging, but we did have to stage it in a way where they were waiting and then we had Julia since it is her journey um, and I was able to follow her, but that was just a really, really lucky scene, to be honest. I was very nervous because I had one shot to get that right. That is not a situation you can have them do again and it feels the same. So, yeah, but one of my mistakes and learning from that scene, I actually did not get enough cutaway shots in the park or GVs, and it was very challenging to paint that later on um, because... I had this like continuous scene that we weren't going to use all of and not enough like treetops and lake shots and that sort of thing. So that was a, a lesson I learned that day. Uh, Zhao Yin sent in a question. This is perhaps more to your editor. How do you determine whether a story should be a self-authored video rather than a text profile or, or any other type of video? That's a great question. Hi, Zhao Yin. Um, I... I think oftentimes stories can be both. A story can be a brilliant um, print piece or a brilliant uh, maybe long form read. But the question we have to ask ourselves in video is what would, experience, what would the experience of seeing this in video uh, add that you're not getting in other mediums? Because sometimes you know, you can have a long investigative piece or you can even have an explainer about a policy, but video allows us to hone in on really the human impact and hear directly from those most impacted. So I think it comes down on the person doing the pitching. Like I have to sometimes ask myself, is this a video story? Um, or sometimes I'll think, you know, even with next door neighbor sisters, I was like, this has been covered by, I think CBS this morning did it or Major outlets have covered this, but no one had covered it in a self-authored video. So no one had been able to experience the story as told by the sisters. And sometimes in video, it's not about having the newest story idea. Rarely are we breaking stories just by sheer nature of the fact that we're a small team covering the entire US. So it's often about, okay, what are we adding by doing this in video? And I think nine times out of 10, a video is just stronger <laughs> if it's done self-authored. But I do acknowledge that there are some stories and in more 
explainer type formats where it is really helpful to have a correspondent and it, you, you really do need someone to kind of walk you through what's going on. So there is a place for all kinds of video, but my personal preference is just, I, I love making self-authored films. Hannah, I could listen to you all day long. And I'm sure everyone who's is listening could as well. However, I am slightly aware that people do have work to go back to and you've got work to get on with today. I'm going to miss the next film that we were going to show. I'm going to jump straight to Andy because I think Andy is such a great film and it's so relevant for so many people who are kind of unable to get out filming. Um, tell us about the Andy film while I line it up. If you could queue up Andy and what the film's about, and how you went about getting the story and how you went about recording the interviews and so on. I will get the, the clip set up for us. Yeah, so I, uh, a year, almost and a half ago, I saw an article about a TikTok uh -huh. video that had gone viral. And in the TikTok video, uh, a young man named Andy, who is a trans man in Texas, um, was turning 18 in his high school. It was on his birthday. His friends in his school choir room surprised him with, they yelled happy birthday and cheered. And then they gave him enough money for him to legally change his name. And Andy's so overwhelmed, he collapses onto the floor weeping. And I was like, wow, this is a powerful TikTok video. And I have so many questions about this kid. You know, what was his journey like up until this point? Why are his friends gifting him with money? You know, when does that mean his parents either weren't willing or able to provide him with money to change his name? What's it like to be a trans teen in Texas right now? Um, and I think that's a lesson we can all take away. If you see a viral, TikTok videos are all self-authored. These are people posting stories about themselves. If you see a video on social media and you're and you have questions about it, it means there's probably more to the story and it may be worth reaching out and following up. So that's what I did. I reached out. I had a phone call with him. He was an amazing talker. He was exactly all of the things I look for when I'm looking for contributors who can successfully do self-authored films. And I pitched the idea. My editors approved. My plan was to go to Texas and film a pretty simple profile video, kind of a day in the life of a trans teen in Texas. And then COVID hit and there was no way we were able to travel anytime soon. And my dear friend and colleague, Shrey Popat, who may be on this, um, I was talking at him about this idea. <laughs> and I said, I don't think it'll, you know, it, it's kind of unfortunate we can't do it. I was thinking maybe I could have him film his own life on his cell phone over an extended period of time, but I don't know how that would work. And Shrey said, this is a good idea. Let's do it. If he hadn't said that, it wouldn't exist today because I legitimately didn't have a lot of faith in the idea. So what Shrey and I did over the last, over the course of the year then is we conducted interviews over Zoom. We had Andy film those on his cell phone. Uh, and send us the recordings. And then much like you would plan out any other shoot, we we showed Andy how to film five shot sequences on his cell phone. We told him what we would love for him to film in terms of B-roll and sequences. And we just stuck with it for a year. And then we had hundreds of cell phone videos. And this is what the result was. So I'll, I'll let you, I'll, I'll stop talking <laughs> and let you just watch it. At the time, my hair was like about like this to this long. It's like really long. It was really heavy and it was actually like causing me neck pain. So I was like, huh, I want to get my hair cut. I would use that reasoning almost as like a cover up excuse for deep down why I actually really wanted my hair cut. Over time, the feeling got stronger and stronger. Then I started realizing, I think there's something different here at play. Basically, I got it all chopped off. When we went inside the car, I immediately started like bawling. I'm so happy. I wanted this for so long. This feels better than I ever expected. <laughs> 
when I finally like realized why I felt like that, it like, it was like a light bulb explosion. It was like, oh my God, it got me so excited. It was probably the big changing moment to make me realize, yeah, no, I'm probably, probably transgender. I want to officially say, hey, I want to be referred to as Andy from now on. If you guys have any questions at all, feel free to swipe up and ask me. I will be glad to answer. I was like scared, obviously, that some people might not think that it's okay, especially the adults, but I felt like, like happy, like really happy. There's something about content made remotely that I absolutely love. I think it's so much more intimate. And I think probably it comes down to the fact that you're not turning up at somebody's house with lights and the big camera and sticking the big camera and the lights in their face and asking them really personal questions, which is a really unnatural thing for people to, to have to deal with. Whereas with Zoom, it's just such a more kind of personal, intimate experience i heard this bit of advice several years ago um and i don't remember who told me so if you're out there listening thank you but this person said make the problem your solution and i think that's something beyond covid we can all take with us you are going to hit roadblocks and you're going to nothing's going to really go according to your plan so you kind of have to use what you do have and lean into that and we thought we can make a really short uh, video where Andy's filming himself and that'll be that, or we can really go all in on this. And the beautiful thing about this that I think we can continue to do within the BBC is the budget was almost zero. We paid for an illustrator, but this cost us nothing because we weren't traveling. And we did this um, as we were doing all of our regular stories because we're talking like one Zoom interview a month, and then we had to keep up with organizing it. It took us about a full month to do the edit. In total, it's a, it's a, it was a half hour TV doc, but this is something that if you find a compelling contributor through social media, um, and you do wanna do something like this, you it, it's not really costing you a lot of time or money, so it's easier to make that argument of, we're getting a really intimate perspective into this person's life. You won't see the result for maybe six months or a year, but it's not going to really cost us much in terms of upfront cost. Um, and Andy was, this would not have worked without Andy. He was absolutely amazing. And the beautiful thing about uh, the youth of today, uh, for better or worse, is that they do document everything. So Andy had that Snapchat video of himself coming out. He had photos and Instagram videos from throughout his teen years that we were then able to use. It's like he had already been making his self author film before we came along and uh, intruded into his life. So it was really a fun and really meaningful experimental thing to do. But, you know, we're not, we didn't invent this. Um, I'm sure you've seen a lot of this kind of thing come out of the pandemic, and I do think it will continue even as we go back to film in person. The beauty of this as well is that you can, if there are holes in your story, if there's bits that you need, if, you, if you're listening to the interview and you're thinking, oh, damn, they, they, they didn't answer that as I thought they answered it, you can just get on Zoom and, and do, the, do that question again, right? It, it's a, exactly. It's, yeah. Exactly. It's actually a bit lower uh, stakes because we got even farther along in the edit and realized, ooh, we actually really need him to talk about X, Y, and Z. Exactly. As you said, we hop on a Zoom call, he's able to fill in those gaps and we can add it into the edit. So it's actually something that will probably forever change how at least I am approaching these kinds of stories. Yeah, I, I'm a huge, what do we call it, uh, making video remotely 
advocate. I think it's such a powerful tool for, for so many reasons. And I also think because it is free, it buys us a bit more scope to be experimentative. You know, if you're going out to film someone, you've persuaded your boss to, you know, cough up lots of money, you feel almost constrained to, to do it in the way that you know is going to work and is going to be absolutely, you know, safe. Whereas actually, if you're doing something free over Zoom, it gives you a lot more freedom to really experiment, which is what digital video is all about. Yeah. Um, Ali asks, how much time do you normally spend editing a video? How long is mm. a piece of string? But uh, yeah, how, how long would you spend ed editing Andy, for instance, or? It's a, that's a great question because, and I, I hate that I'm gonna say this answer, but it really does depend on what I'm doing. In, in the last couple of years, I've been doing more documentaries, more kind of 23 minute digital videos that are half hour TV docs. But then we also make those into a six minute Facebook watch episode for our Cut Through the Noise show. It's also on YouTube. There's also a 10 minute cut down on the BBC News website. There's the full version on BBC Real and YouTube. So I'm always making like eight versions of one story. And that process can take several weeks. Um, but I always edit the long version first because it's a lot easier to then lift out sections to condense it into a smaller piece. I would say, so Andy, we probably spent four solid weeks just cranking out the edit. And then it took two weeks to do all of the different versions of it. Um, but I had help, Shrey also helped me to edit that. So I wasn't the only one doing it. Um, but I'd say it takes a solid month at least. And I, yes, more time is always helpful. Um, but I am someone who I need a little bit of pressure to be creative and productive. So as much as I hate deadlines that are tighter than I would like them to be, I understand that that's actually important for me to then do my best work. And then my editors are really great and accommodating. So if I meet that deadline, but then need more time to finesse or do other versions, then they're really gracious about giving me that time. But my editors know me as well. And they know that I need a, to work within a deadline because when you're doing long form stuff, it's really like you're editing like eight digital videos um, just by the sheer length. And I end up doing these in chapters and scenes. And so if it has, you know, six to eight chapters, it's like you're just doing eight videos, which is a lot. I think in the past, if I'm editing cut through the noise, if I'm kind of the video editor that week, I can do that edit in two days. Um, so I've had to be really nimble and be able to edit things very, very quickly. Um, and also sometimes it just takes longer. <laughs> so it really depends on what I'm doing. So how would you work with an illustrator? For those who haven't worked with an illustrator, what's the best way of working with an illustrator? That's a great question. What Shrey and I decided to do is, the if you're gonna use an illustrator, there needs to be a purpose. You don't wanna just bring an illustrator and animator on board because you think it'll make it pretty or add fluff. There needs to be, it needs to be a device. And basically we knew visuals wise, we had Andy's interviews, we had the B-roll we had him film, we had archival material that he had already filmed, we had photos. But when he was describing his emotional life and his inner world, we had nothing. And so we thought that's how we're gonna use illustrations and animations we can have someone draw and bring to life his inner emotional world. And that will be something that recurs throughout the piece and kind of helps to tie it together and honestly give the viewer a break from watching cell phone footage. As much as we tried to glam it up as much as possible, we spent a lot of time talking about kind of our visual design principles and how we wanted it to look and be consistent throughout within the confines of Final Cut. As you all know, it kind of does have its limitations. Um, we knew that the emo if we could really make his emotional life sing, that would be a huge gift to the entire piece. And so what we did is once we had the whole thing scripted, we identified the moments where he's talking about his inner world and his emotions. And 
Andy gave us everything we need. He speaks in such a profound and visual way. The light bulb moment section, um, that was all him. He said, when I came out, when I got that haircut, it felt as if a light bulb went off in my mind and like everything looked different. Everything was different for me. And so there you have it already. Like we just needed someone to draw what he was already describing was going on in his head. And I would say as much as possible, use the people you have, use what they're giving you. They're giving you probably what you need. And then you are basically the go-between between between your contributor and the artist you're working with to say, okay, here's how he describes this moment. Uh, You figure out what style you want to do that in, but we want to see a light bulb explosion coming out of his head. (laughs) And so we, we wrote up like five different briefs based on the bites in the script where he's describing his emotional world and then um, Elena Perez who was our illustrator and animator sometimes you need two different people sometimes one person can do both of those things she did an amazing job and uh, she took it from there brilliant oh it was Kamal from Kathmandu who asked that question so thanks very much Kamal um Neha asks uh you come up with such offbeat ideas do you follow any particular websites or publications to get these ideas or do you just chance across them um it is totally a combination of a lot of different things and sometimes I really have to work to convince other people and myself that it's it that there's something special there but a few things that I do on a practical level are um, I do read local newspapers Um, And I'm a subscriber of the Washington Post Optimist Newsletter. I think that's actually how I saw the sister neighbor story. But I I subscribe to different um, newsletters and then I'm kind of getting things in my inbox. I find it helpful to just scan local newspapers because oftentimes those stories, uh, those are the ones that we don't have access to. You know, I'm based in DC. I'm not based in towns across the U.S. and I'm not able to like build those relationships over a long period of time. But the video we didn't have time to watch today is an example of um, a column I read in the San Francisco Chronicle about a couple who had been experiencing homelessness. They moved in and and they're black, a black couple moved in with a white uh, millionaire in Oakland, California. And that was the result of a brilliant columnist, um, Otis Taylor Jr. at the Chronicle, the San Francisco Chronicle, who had been following this story. And we basically formed a partnership for that story with the Chronicle. And Otis was our main contributor and our narrator who walked us through the story. But it's about sometimes reading between the lines and asking yourself, okay, this this news event happened, but what happens after that? What happens after all the other outlets go home? But it's kind of because video gives us more flexibility, um, it's tying it to the news. But again, looking a little deeper and a little further down the road to, to say, okay, here's the human impact of this news event that we covered. But two, three years later, this is what that actually means for people. Um, and it's it's kind of slow food, not fast food. Um, a couple more questions. Paul asks, what are your target audience considerations when finding contributors? Do you think about, e.g., aiming at young female audiences to hit targets, or do you aim to find the most interesting people who will resonate across all audiences? I definitely try to find Um, young people, women, people of color. Um, I know that as a company, we need to expand our audience. And quite honestly, naturally, those are the stories I'm interested in anyway. I also feel like as a woman doing this job, there are certain stories where I have access, like I can make another young woman feel a lot more comfortable um, going into that space and filming that. So I, I, I try to focus on the things that if I find it interesting, maybe someone else will. I'm not saying I have the greatest taste, but you know, maybe there's something there. If I'm really intrigued or really captivated by someone, hopefully 
everyone will be, no matter what your social location is or your race is. But I do try to prioritize um, marginalized people and, and particularly women, because I know that we need to grow our audience. We need to serve those audiences in ways that we're just not doing uh, right now. Hannah, what would you like today's audience to take from this session? What what kind of over, what tips would you give an aspiring young VJ or someone who just wants you know just wants to learn from your incredible knowledge? I would say uh, trust your gut, and I don't want that to sound cliche. I almost didn't do the sister neighbor story because I was initially really interested, but I didn't. Feel like other people were it wasn't news um, and it kept getting put on the back burner and then I said I'm just gonna do it and I'm so glad I did and that was such a last minute kind of random story and that's probably the story I've done that's gotten the most response from people in, in terms of like wow this resonated with me I felt something from this and it really tr taught me to trust my gut if you are interested in or curious about something pursue that. And if you need to keep pitching it multiple times, it may take, sometimes it, it takes a year of pitching something, honestly. And I just keep saying it until uh, we're able to make, make it happen and squeeze it into all the other stuff we have going on. If you think it's interesting, it's probably interesting and you should probably stick with it, even if it takes a long time. And then also I would say on a practical level in your interviews, command the space, be in control, make people comfortable, build in that time for silence and do your interviews first so that you have a better launching pad for your B-roll. And if we do another session like this in five years time, Hannah, uh, what will digital video look like, do you think? And is there still gonna be a demand for the self-authored? My first answer is I don't know what it will look like, but if I had to guess, I do think there's an interesting movement where TV want more digital video. And at least here in DC, um, World News America, they love to run our digital videos that we're already making. So I, I do think with social media being completely first person based and drawing people in with the increase of streaming platforms and prevalence of you know, HBO shows and what have you, I think there will continue to be a demand for self-authored stories. Um, it seems like the digital video model, there are different videos for different purposes. So our, our news website serves a purpose and people wanna see uh, voices and hear sounds from a protest or something that's happening. But I also think there is a growing appetite in, in part to the pandemic because people have been at home on their couch dedicating time to watching streaming shows and TV. I do think amongst older generations, there is more of an appetite for long form stuff. But I also feel like this changes every other year. So I think the most important thing is to keep doing what we're doing in the best ways that we can and I do not think self-authored is going anywhere I think that will continue to be what people want and what moves people the most I'm aware I've missed a few questions I'm really really sorry I, why don't we just do kind of almost like a quick you've got 10 seconds to answer each of these questions Hannah okay. I'll be, I'll, right, yeah I'll try to keep myself focused is it bad to have too much raw material for a short documentary no the more the better i'd rather be drowning uh, i kind of agree as well um da, 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 uh, da, 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 da. uh the style for many of bbc self-authored has been to start with the contributor introducing themselves to avoid repetitiveness what other ways can we start the self-authored film i would refer to your um is it gist just formula, yeah. Formula where you're grabbing their attention with something else, and then you come back and have the introduction. I, I would shy away from just immediately having them say, my name is Roger, I'm a coal miner, and this is what my story is. Instead, let's see Roger doing coal mining and 
see it, hear an upshot of him talking to his friend or hear something interesting from his interview, then have your title if, if that's your vibe and you want a title plate, and then come back and introduce who he is. But you have to grab people. In digital video, we are we are contractually entering this agreement with the audience. We have to convince them to stick around when they have so many other things they can watch. Whereas TV, they're set, they're committed to watching all the way through. Uh, the the first 10 seconds of what we do are more important than anything else. Curiosity is the thing that I'm always trying to stimulate. Um, and I will ask two or three questions specifically to get answers from my interviewee to try and get them to say something that will stimulate curiosity with, with the viewer. Um, right, Amir's asked a really challenging question. Basically, we, we did kind of touch on this earlier on. Uh, he says there's so much to concentrate on when you're out being a VJ, like uh, like focus, like exposure, like eye contact, like thinking about the questions. What tips have you got for him? What what one thing could you say to him that would just make everything a little bit easier? It does get better with experience. The more you do it, the easier it does get. Um, have a checklist and focus on one thing at a time. If you need to say to your contributor, I just need two minutes I'm going to set up, then focus on setting up. And it's okay if you can't carry a conversation with them while you're setting up. Really tell yourself, okay, right now I'm setting up. I'm going to make sure my shot is good. Now I'm going to switch gear. Now I'm pressing record. I'm switching gears. Now I'm going to sit in the chair and I'm going to start the interview. If you need, you are in control. That's the thing to remember. You are in control. Don't let the pressure of everything going on get to you because you can say in the middle of the interview, great. And I often do this. I'm going to pause this right here. Check that things are still looking good. Check that things are sounding good. Can I get you a water? How are we doing? And then continue on. Like you are in the driver's seat. I think as well, the more prepared you are, the better it will go. No yeah. doubt. There's a saying by a golfer, isn't there? That the more I practice, the luckier I get. And I think that's so true, especially with like yeah. digital video. If you go prepared, you know what questions you're going to ask, you know what answers you're trying to get, uh, you um, you know what shots you're going to get, you know what things you're looking for. By, by having a list, you can just tick those off and that buys you so much more time to get lucky with the other stuff, the things you're not expecting, the answers you're not expecting, the shots you're not expecting. You have much more time to do to find those things when you're organized and you're getting the things you need. And if you're starting out, it's okay to practice. Say to your editor, I need to build this into my workday. I need to I need to really practice setting up. If you can find a room, set up your camera, how you're gonna do it. If you're doing a two camera shot, grab a coworker, have them sit in the seat so you can test things out. Literally nothing is, um, I, I used to practice opening the tripod and closing it. Um, and, and tricks for like how to use gravity to close the tripod. And this is part of what I was taught in journalism school too. I had the advantage of being in that safe learning environment where I could do that stuff. But the more confident you are, the less you have to think about some of that stuff and the less you're worried about fumbling around and not looking like you know what you're doing. So practice setting up your tripod, set your shot, checking your exposure, your white balance, your sound, making sure you're happy. The more you can actually do that before you get there, if you're not shooting as often as you want to be, that will only help you. I think as well, practicing your interviews as well, right? We can practice interviews now over Zoom, you know, just yeah. contact your friends and interview them because holding an interview is such an important skill. I prepare, I'm not clever enough to think about my camera exposure you know, the safety of my contributor, all these things you're thinking about as a VJ and, you know, make up an interview as I'm going along. I have to prepare my interviews and I basically I prepare by thinking about the answers I'm trying to get. I pare my questions down to as short as possible. I stick the word describe in every single question. And uh, yeah, I just find it so, so much more easy. You'll notice the questions I've asked Hannah today 
are with a slight view to doing a self-authored film, this is the kind of questions I will be asking. I've asked her right at the beginning to introduce herself and describe what she does. I've described, asked her to describe what a self-authored film is. I've asked her to describe uh, her tips to us. I'm now thinking with these questions about my kind of closing thought at the end of the piece. I'm hoping to turn this session into a short self-authored film with Hannah. I hope it works. We've talked so long that it's going to be quite an edit. <laughs> yeah, um, you have a tough job ahead of you. I don't <laughs> envy you. Um, genuinely, I'm so grateful to Hannah. This has been truly one of the um, most useful sessions I think we've we've put on. Um, thank you so, so, so much, Hannah. If there are any more questions, please quickly chuck them in. People are sending in lots and lots of really nice things. Hannah, uh, I'm just going to read thank them Thank you all you. so much for joining. I hope I hope that you found it helpful. And um, don't hesitate to reach out if you want to be in conversation about something we talked about or just, you know, I want to encourage collaborations.